Welcome to the show. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and this is Outliers. In each episode, I sit down with someone in the top 1% of their profession to decode what they've mastered and what they've learned along the way, diving deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. And today I'm talking with Mark Sisson of Primal Blueprint, Primal Kitchen, and Keto for Life fame. Mark was one of the pioneers of the paleo and ancestral health movement. He started his blog, Mark's Daily Apple, in 2006, and today it's read by more than 3 million people every single month. He's also written and co-written 18 books on health and nutrition, including the New York Times bestseller, Keto Reset Diet, and the insanely popular Primal Blueprint. In 2015, he founded Primal Kitchen, and after enormous growth, sold that business to Kraft Heinz for $200 million in 2018. Mark's an expert on paleo, primal, and ancestral health and nutrition. And in this episode, we cover so much, including lessons learned building Primal Kitchen, Mark's health and nutrition journey, and his thoughts on diet, exercise, vitamin D, and so much more. It was a huge honor to have Mark on Outliers. As always, you can find the notes and transcript for this episode at danielscrivener.com. And with that, enjoy my wide-ranging conversation on health, nutrition, and performance with Mark Sisson. Mark, I am so excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much for coming on Outliers. It's such a pleasure to be here. Mark, to kick things off, I wanted to see if you can take us back in time a little bit and tell us a little bit about your own history and journey as an athlete. What my early recollection of athletics was, I was pretty small. I was not really strong or big enough to play the traditional American sports, football, basketball, baseball, hockey was big in in New England. And because I lived about a mile and a half from school, I found it convenient just to jog to and from school as a means of transportation. I didn't like taking the bus. I could actually beat the bus home if I jogged. So from literally sixth and seventh grade, I started running to and from school out of convenience. And by the time I got to be a freshman in high school, I was pretty fit. And I really was thinking in terms of what I could do in terms of a sport that I could participate in and kind of make my name among all of the other athletes that were excelling at other sports at school. At about the same time, I had read a number of books on health and fitness. I was kind of a geeky kid and was interested in health and fitness at an early age. And so I'd read Ken Cooper's book in 1968. He wrote a book called Aerobics, in which he really sort of launched the entire aerobics movement by making the sort of statement that I think he recanted years later, but the statement that literally the more aerobic stuff you undertook, the better it was for your heart and the longer you would live. So that kind of resonated with me. And I thought, well, I'm doing this running thing and I'm, I'm pretty good at it and I'm pretty fit at it. And it must be good for me. It must be healthy because I'm reading the conventional wisdom of the day, which is suggesting as much. So I went out for the track team and, and lo and behold, I started winning the mile and the two mile at track meets in these local main high school events. That gave me a fair level of confidence that I was onto something here. And I kept pursuing this running career through high school. I went to a prep school a few years later. I went to the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. And then from there, I went to college in Western Massachusetts. And so I was captain of the cross country team in high school, and I was captain of the cross country and track team in college. And as I pursued my studies, which was based around pre-med with an emphasis on evolutionary biology, I continued to be sort of intrigued by the concept of maximizing human performance. So I got out of college. I dedicated the next few years to training for the U.S. Olympic trials and the marathon. I read everything I could get my hands on regarding health and fitness, but mostly performance. What sort of foods could we eat to enhance performance? What kind of workouts could we do to improve performance? How could we run faster? How could we become stronger? What sort of supplements we could take? that would legally improve this process. And so I started to collect this library of documentation on how to do it right, or at least what conventional wisdom thought at the time was the right way to do that. Within that three-year period of, say, 1970, well, five-year period from 1975 to 1980, I finished fifth in the U.S. National Championships in the marathon. I did qualify for the U.S. Olympic trials for the 1980 Olympic trials race. And I became quite an accomplished, if you will, endurance athlete, even though my genetics, as I go back and look over them now with 23andMe, my genetics would not have predicted that I would have been that sort of a national caliber runner. I got injured 
as a runner, and that was the first real kind of glitch in my road to health, injured so much that I really couldn't continue to run at 100 plus miles a week at the elite level. So I just kind of pivoted over to triathlon. This was the early days of triathlon. Within a year and a half, I'd finished fourth at Ironman in Hawaii. But by then, I was already getting a little bit disillusioned with what I thought was this pursuit of health, but in fact, was an ill-fated attempt at improving performance at the expense of health. I was getting more and more injured. I was getting, and then I was starting to now realize I had these other maladies that were, whether or not they were indicative of injuries, they were certainly indicative of inflammation. I had arthritis in my feet. I had tendonitis in my hips. I had a severe irritable bowel syndrome from the age of 14, right up through the age of 47. I had GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I would get sick a lot. I'd get colds and flu a lot throughout the year. I realized there was something really wrong with this picture. And even though I was on the cover of Runner's World magazine three times as the epitome of like fit, healthy lifestyle, I was sort of literally dying on the inside. So I had to quit competing. I just couldn't compete at a high level anymore. And I was over it. I was kind of, let's see what the next phase of my life is going to bring. But I did want to continue this pursuit of excellence and this pursuit of health. I mean, I kind of lost my way. I'd, I'd forgotten that I was really interested in achieving good health along with performance. And I'd sacrificed my health in the name of performance. So I wondered if there was a way in which we could kind of have both, that, that I could be strong and lean and fit and happy and healthy and productive and, and shiny and sparkly and all the things that people want without all of this pain and suffering and sacrifice, of which there was a lot in distance running. It's really about managing discomfort day in and day out. There's not a lot of fun in training for endurance competition. So I set about to really understand how the body works, called upon my background in pre-med and evolutionary biology. And about that time, there was this emerging science of genetics that was kind of taking the forefront. And it was starting to be clear that everything that happened in the human body happened at the level of gene expression, that everything you did every food you ate, every type of exercise you chose to do, the amount of stress you undertook, the amount of sleep you got, the amount of sun exposure you got, the amount of play you engaged in had some effect on how the genes turn on or off and create proteins that respond to the stimulus that you're creating with your behaviors and your habits. That really fascinated me. And so in combination with the evolutionary background, I started to look at ways in which, well, maybe we're not meant to be running 100 miles a week to achieve good health. Maybe we're meant to find, as Tim Ferriss would say, the minimum effective dose of exercise. And as I look back on, by way of example, I look back on hunter-gatherer history, and those people in the name of survival were exceptionally fit and exceptionally healthy and chose not to do a lot of exercise that they didn't have to do to survive. And yet, because they did short bouts of exercise, and they were always constantly moving around a little bit. They kept their range of motion throughout their years. They were generally very healthy. They had generally low body fat, the occurrence of obesity and type 2 diabetes, and even cancer and heart disease were virtually non-existent in some of these communities. There must be a link there. So I started to put together this sort of list of what I would call hidden genetic switches that we all have. And it became my obsession to identify these hidden genetic switches and then to advise through education, advise people on how to access the benefits, like how to turn on the genes that build muscle, how to turn off those genes that want to store more fat, how to turn on the genes that burn fat or build an immune system or build stronger bones, how to turn off those genes that want to tear bone tissue down and decrease bone density. It's a really interesting level of consciousness that until probably 10 or 15 years ago, all but a handful of people in the world knew nothing about. So I wanted to make this information available to as many people as possible. Not that I had the right way or the only way. I had a way that was based in science. If you understood how this way operates and how the body is basically the result of millions of years of evolution, DNA is basically what it is today, forged in a crucible of 100 million years of mammalian evolution and the last two and a half million years of human evolution, and how if we are able to identify some of these behaviors and some of these 
things that we do, we can optimize health. With that in mind, I started a blog in 2006 called Mark's Daily Apple. And I used that blog to espouse these beliefs and to start to put into writing some of these findings that I'd come up with. And I don't do original research. I just comb the literature for examples of research that sort of prove this point. And so Mark's Daily Apple was my major magnum opus, if you will, starting in 2006. In telling this story, I've skipped 30 years of other businesses and trial and error and making money and losing money. But this is really where the current story begins around 2006. And I think I'll stop there and let you ask whatever you need to ask. (laughs) No, that was fascinating. And I have so many questions that I could ask, but I'm curious, and we'll get into this a lot more, but obviously I think anyone listening to you talking about kind of finding this thing that it seems like we had forgotten and moved away from, but that when you really explain it, I mean, I feel like it's hard for someone to listen to that and feel like it doesn't sound accurate. It doesn't make sense. So I'm curious, like a lot of what you espouse has to do with kind of ancestral wisdom and just understanding that things have gotten very different over the last hundred years. But if we were to go back in time, we should maybe imitate or try to emulate kind of earlier periods of human life. Like, why do you think that we've gotten so far away from that? And now simply saying some of those things is is so jarring (laughs) and people disagree with it so much. It's a good point. It's a good question. I think humans and most animals in general don't want to work hard. They want to do as little as possible to survive and if possible, thrive. That's just the nature of the living organism is to conserve energy. Look, the nature of a living organism is at its essence to live long enough to procreate past the genetic material along to the next generation. And then your work is done. So with that in mind, I think nature set up most organisms in a way that wants them to try and conserve energy. And in terms of humans, our brains are the complex organ that has become our primary tool, our brain has created a lifestyle in which it's easy to not do anything. Food is everywhere. We don't have to hunt or gather food anymore. It's virtually everywhere we look. Obviously, third world countries notwithstanding, but in developed nations, food is not an issue. It's around every corner and and most of it is not good food. Most of it is food that has been packaged and processed to appeal to those basic primal instincts of crunchy, salty, fatty, sweet, which were few and far between 10,000 years ago or even 200 years ago, and especially a million years ago. But right now, crunchy, salty, fatty, sweet is like that's the driver of that little appetite center in the brain for a lot of people. So between appetite, cravings, hunger, access to food, and then the unwillingness to undertake some form of exercise because it's associated with discipline and misery and struggle and suffer has put us in this position where 40% of us are obese and two thirds of us, at least in this country, are at least overweight, tens of millions of undiagnosed cases of type two diabetes, all sorts of inflammation, heart disease, cancer. And these are all an artifact of our perfect human bodies and our perfect genes responding to the inputs that we've chosen to give them. And when I say chosen, we've done so unknowingly. Most of us have chosen to eat a certain way or to move a certain way or to live a certain way, not so much out of willingness to flout nature, but just because it seems easy and we didn't know any better. I think most people would love to do the right thing if they knew what the right thing is. And many people, and this has been the history of weight loss, for instance, over the last 30 or 40 years, Many people thought that eating fat made you fat. Many people thought the way to lose weight was to exercise more. Many people have thought that that eating fat and cholesterol gives you heart disease and cancer. Many people have thought that the only way to lose weight is to cut calories way, way, way back. And it doesn't matter what you eat. And many people have thought that this was just a, a simple math equation of calories in, calories out. And none of that is true. The human body is a complex system. And if you understand how it works, There are ways to, I hate the word hack, but I'm going to use it. There are ways to hack this that will get you to your goal of more energy, better sleep, better sex, better production, ideal body composition without any of the struggle and suffer and pain and sacrifice, without any of the 
portion control and calorie counting that you might have thought was required to get there. And that's really, again, that's been what I see as my job is to educate the world into how to access these untapped hidden genetic switches that we all have and achieve optimal health if we want to. And I'm not saying everyone should or needs to, but if you want to, I have some good information for you. (laughs) So I want to dive into one thing that you said there, which is you gave this whole list of examples of things that where people just totally miss the picture. And in all those, it seems like the commonality is people don't take into account that there's a lot of different inputs and they're trying to come up with one, kind of the simplest explanation for something or the simplest way to improve something where it's just like, don't eat fat if you don't want to be fat. How would you, maybe if you were to try to reset people's expectations or give a quick summary of why that's wrong and the better way to think about it, do you have a sense for how you would kind of describe that or lay that out? I have a sense. And here's what it looked like. I could tell you everything you need to do to get really, really healthy on two sheets of paper. However, I've written 15 books and done hundreds of lectures and have done podcasts. And because this is such a suspension of disbelief for so many people that it takes kind of me walking you back to the beginning to understand why this is and how this is. And my just, again, I can give you the information about how to do this very simple by bullet point, but you might say, well, that's my doctor would not agree. My doctor would not say that eating, that there, my doctor would say, for instance, there's nothing such as a healthy fat. All fats are bad. You want to cut back all fats. Or my doctor would say, he just said, I have to eat less and exercise more. And so for me to, I would start by saying the calories in, calories out theory, which they sometimes people would cite the laws of thermodynamics. But the reality is it's really about calories burned versus calories stored. And we store calories based on a number of different inputs, some of which have to do with how much insulin we produce. And insulin is produced in an environment that is typically high in carbohydrate. And carbohydrate includes sugars and and all forms of of carbohydrate, like grains, processed grains and sugars and sweetened beverages and desserts, pies, cakes, candies, cookies, breads, pasta, cereal, even potatoes and starchy tubers. When you look at the standard American diet, most people consume 300 to 600 grams of carbs a day, which wreaks havoc on their insulin production, which in turn causes them to tend to store every excess calorie, not just calories from carbs, but every excess calories as fat. And in the irony of ironies, that same amount of insulin production locks the fat into the fat cells. So it cannot be taken out and burned by the muscles, even if necessary. And to understand this complexity of the human body and how insulin is at its base level, I mean, there are a lot of different hormones at work here, but insulin is sort of the the driving force. If you can control insulin, and if you can keep your insulin levels low, you can access your stored body fat all the time. And you don't have to eat nearly as many calories to be have the energy and to have the body fat, I mean, have the body composition that you want. And it's a process. You have to train the body to do it. Look, we're born with a factory setting that allows us to easily store fat, but also to easily burn off fat in periods of, well, historically in periods of famine. But even now, if we simply choose to skip a meal, we have all these systems that the body can tap into and start accessing energy from stored body fat if we've trained the body to do that. But if we've never trained the body to do that, if we override this fat resetting that we all have at birth and start getting into this carbohydrate dependency from an early age, then we really never train those systems that are great at burning fat and, in fact, are more efficient when fat is being burned. And in the process of being efficient, and I call the term metabolic flexibility, so we're achieving We're trying to access what we call metabolic flexibility. And with that, we find that we don't need to eat as much to keep our energy levels up. We don't need to eat as much to keep our muscles strong and healthy and even growing. And this is probably the most important part. We don't get hungry that often. So our hunger, appetite, and cravings dissipate. And one of the things that happens when you achieve metabolic flexibility is you start to realize, wow, three meals a day plus snacks is way too much food. 
that's just way too much food. I can't even, now that I'm so good at accessing my own stored body fat, and now that I realized that so much of what I was doing was just feeding this beast that kept trying to restore my blood sugar, my blood glucose. Once you get past that and develop metabolic flexibility, you realize, wow, I only need two meals a day. And even those two meals don't even need to be huge. And the beauty of it, again, is that I don't get hungry. I mean, I get a little bit hungry, but I don't get hangry. I don't get ravenous. I don't get lightheaded or starry-eyed because my blood sugar is low. No, you've trained your body to access stored body fat and to produce and utilize this fourth fuel, this magic fourth fuel that we all have, which is called ketones. I want to dive into a bunch of kind of what I've noted down as like building blocks, things like metabolic flexibility you just touched on. But just really quickly, can we talk a little bit about things that go into kind of moving someone to metabolic flexibility? Like I'm guessing part of that, which you alluded to is intermittent fasting. Part of it is changing your diets, moving away from carbs and starches. But can you talk about the handful of things that really help someone to move towards? So there are three basic types of food that we tell people you just need to avoid for a couple of weeks if you're going to reset your setting here and try to develop metabolic flexibility. The first is you have to recognize that so much of your current diet contains a lot of sugar. And sugar isn't just like that white stuff in the bowl on your table. It's glucose, fructose, galactose. It's every form of carbohydrate that converts to glucose once it hits your gut to the extent that you could eat a bowl of rice and your body wouldn't know the difference between the glucose that it produced there and a bowl of Skittles. So rice produces a lot of glucose, sugar. So cutting back on sugars of all kinds, the obvious ones, the sweetened beverages, the teas, the Cokes, the sodas, the pies, the cakes, the candies, desserts, I mean, all the stuff that we sort of know we probably shouldn't be eating, certainly on a daily basis, but maybe once in a while. So you cut back on the sugars. The next thing you cut back on is what we call the industrial seed oils. In the last three or four years, a lot of research, my own included, has sort of indicated that these industrial seed oils might even be a worse offender, more insidious than sugar. And this would be corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil. These are the oils that are derived from seeds. Corn is a grass seed and soy is a seed. So these are industrially processed oils that are high in omega-6 fats, and they're also just, they're sort of a franken oil that the body just doesn't know what to do with. And so a lot of times the body incorporates it into the cell membrane and it becomes a dysfunctional fat that's part of a what the cell thought it was using a legitimate building block and now it isn't. So we see a lot of people who have had a lot of industrial seed oils. <laughs> Ironically, the cardiology world has referred to them as vegetable oils. And for a number of years, they were touted as being heart healthy and healthier than animal fats, saturated fats, and so on. The reality is they're not, they're horrible and they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. So anyone who goes down the center aisles of a store and starts to look at what's in some of these packaged goods, will see, again, any mixture of corn oil, safflower, sunflower, soybean, canola, and so just stay away from those. Those are the unhealthy fats that we're going to talk about. Now, there are healthy fats, and they're as different from the unhealthy fats as day and night. I mean, we have things like avocado oil, avocados, butter, lard, ghee, tallow, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil. These are all what we would call very healthy fats, partly because they contain a high level of monounsaturated fats, which now the the cardiac industry would say are heart healthy. They would admit that they're heart healthy. So yeah, there are some fats that you can consume and I recommend consuming them in decent quantities. They're not the kind of fats that I would even, in most cases, suggest people think about avoiding. I just say, go for it. But whenever you see something that has that and none of the other stuff, include that. So, so far we've listed the sugars and the carbohydrates, the starchy carbohydrates, the sort of processed stuff. The industrial seed oils. And then the third group, I'm going to say, for a lot of people, grains. Grains are very problematic, especially if you're trying to reset your metabolism. So clearly, the biggest offender is wheat. I had my greatest health benefits finally arrive and accrue when I got rid of wheat entirely. 
And again, as I say, it wasn't until I was 47, it was 20 years ago that I finally figured this out. Up to then, I'd sort of defended my right to eat grains because I'd been a runner. And the whole time that I was running, I was fueling myself with breads and pastas and cereals and whatever manner of carb I could get my hands on, including beer, whatever. It was all considered in those days. Carbo loading was the big thing because you had to, if you're training like I was 100 miles a week plus, you were doing it every day. So every day at the end of a 15 mile run or 20 mile run in preparation for going out and doing it again the next day, you sort of had to figure out a way to refill the glycogen stores. And glycogen is this is the body's way of storing glucose. And the way to do that was to carbo load. So for the longest time, I was a big eater of grains. And that was ultimately what was causing my IBS, I find out later. So getting rid of grains for me was getting rid of corn, wheat, rye, some of the other offending grains. To this day, I'm not a big fan of some of the pseudo grains like quinoa and things like that. I just don't, it's just beige glop that you need a lot of sauce to make it even halfway palatable. So I don't want to keep beating this too much, but sugars, industrial seed oils, and then getting rid of grains. And so if you can get rid of those three things, you'll come down to a list of beef, pork, lamb, turkey, chicken, fish. It's a lot of great sources of protein, vegetables, any amount of vegetables you want to eat. And my favorites would be you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. I like spinach. I like a big salad every day. So there's a number of vegetables that people can access. Some fruit, not a lot of fruit because fruit is a form of sugar as well. And the occasional starchy tuber, some potato or sweet potato or, or rutabaga or turnip or something like that, what they would call fall root vegetables. And that's kind of the list. And some people are going to listen to this and go, oh my God, that's not a big list. And what about all the other stuff that I could eat? Well, there are currently about 1,500 cookbooks that deal with preparing paleo or primal or keto meals. And virtually every meal that anyone ever eats on keto or paleo or primal would have been considered a decadent meal because of its high fat content and because of its amazing taste. So the point is, what makes these foods that I've just described, once you've gotten rid of pies, cakes, candies, cookies, breads, pasta, cereal, and sweetened beverages, what makes the remaining food not just sustainable, but great tasting and palatable are the methods of preparation, the herbs, the spices, the healthy fats the ways you cook them, the sauces, the dressings, the toppings that you put on them. And that became, later on in my life, a major focus of my work was discovering ways in which we could make otherwise healthy foods taste even better and become more appealing. Yeah, and that ultimately became known as Primal Kitchen, correct? That's correct. So I come to this list and I've been writing about food now for eight years, from 2006 to 2014, I've been writing about food. I've been writing about the benefits of changing your diet. I've been writing about all of the nasty things that we find unwillingly and unwittingly in the foods that we've sort of been consuming with the assumption that they're good for us, but clearly are not. So I've been sort of banishing foods from people's diets for a long time. And I realized, geez, I Every Saturday, we would do a recipe, and sometimes we'd do a recipe on how to make a mayonnaise or how to make a ketchup that didn't have high fructose corn syrup or how to make a salad dressing that wasn't going to be loaded with soybean oil or canola oil as its base. And you certainly couldn't find these things in the store. Everything on the store shelves that I would look at was disappointing. Everything I'd pick the label up and I'd go, oh my God, I can't eat it, as the kids say today. That's when I realized somebody needs to make the kinds of products that people like myself really wished exist, but don't. I mean, I really wanted there to be some line of product that I could purchase ready-made, take it off the shelf, bring it home, shake it up and pour it on my salad without having to get out the blender and then clean the blender with all the oils and stuff that I put in it. And no one had done that. So in 2015, we launched Primal Kitchen Mayonnaise, which happened to be our first condiment. A mayonnaise, a great tasting mayonnaise, is based on avocado oil. We only use avocado oil as the main ingredient. And Eggs from cage-free hens, organic vinegar from non-GMO beets. I mean, the whole thing, you look at, go down the list and it checks off all the boxes. And it was a huge hit. Even though it was more expensive, it was a huge hit with so many people who responded by saying, oh my God, Mark, thank you so much. I've been waiting for this my whole life. 
I'm sick and tired of trying to make my own mayonnaise and having it fail every every second time. And then when it does work, keeping it in the refrigerator for three days and feeling like I might be poisoning my family. So the concept resonated early on and we followed the mayonnaise with a couple of salad dressings, with some ketchup and some mustard, with some pasta sauces. We now have 85 products in the line. So it's really, we decided that we wanted to go into every aisle of the supermarket and identify what it is that people would really like to be eating if they're health conscious, but are afraid to currently consume because of the nasty ingredients that are on the label. So I want to go back just a little bit earlier in that story, because I mean, obviously you had been blogging and writing about this and kind of sharing this news for a while. Clearly you knew it was starting to kind of take off and people were excited about it and interested in it. But given that no products like this existed in the store, I'm guessing it was still a big bet at the time. And you probably saw a lot of pushback or got a lot of pushback about what you were doing and what you were building. What was it like in the lead up to launching that first product and how difficult was it to get that into stores and and have that first success? It was interesting times because when we finally developed a mayonnaise that we could make to scale, and it was not just in my kitchen, but in an industrial setting, we could make a large vat of it. We realized that it was going to have to be priced at $9.95 for a 12-ounce jar. We could go to Costco and spend $8.95 for a 60-ounce jar of one of the competitive ones that's made with the cheap oils. So it was a big risk. And I went to my manufacturer and I said, what's the smallest batch we can do as a first run? Because I don't want to have this sitting on my shelf for a year. It had a one-year shelf life, but I didn't want to overproduce. And he said, well, the smallest batch we can do is 12,000 jars. And I like rolled my eyes and like, oh my goodness, 12,000 jars. Well, we sold out in 10 days. We sold out in 10 days for a number of reasons. The primary reason is that By the time I had launched this product in 2015, I had spent almost 10 years building a brand. So I had a following of millions of people who understood the nature of food and understood how difficult it was to make healthy food and how much of what was happening in the supermarkets and even in the health food stores was not fulfilling the promise of a better way of doing things. So when I launched it, we had a number of different channels. I certainly had a, I had a warehouse where I was doing supplement fulfillment. So it was easy enough for us to wrap in bubble wrap three jars of mayonnaise and ship them off to people across the country. At the same time, I had aligned myself with a new brand new company that I also invested in called Thrive Market. And Thrive Market was launching their platform and wanted a unique product that no one else online carried as their marquee product. And so we worked together in that regard. They took thousands of jars and used that to their advantage and to our advantage. And then because of my, I guess, my notoriety in the paleo world, and particularly in the CrossFit world at the time, one of the buyers for Whole Foods Market in the Rocky Mountain region with 33 stores basically said, look, Mark, normally it takes a year to get in a Whole Foods. You have to go through a review process. You have to wait and see. You have to wait until somebody else gets kicked out before you come in. It's a very lengthy process, but I like what you're doing. We'll take whatever you make in our 33 stores. And so we had an immediate retail presence based on that. I have to say, based on the credibility that I built for myself through educating millions of people over the years, and then one of those people, actually two of those people, because there were two of them at this one Whole Foods region, Two of those people happened to be adherents of my way of thinking, and they were all in when it came to providing their customers this sort of new idea in food enhancement. And once you had that initial success, was it, did things just start to click into place and it was very easy to add items? Because you talked about, I know the business ended up being supplements, a bunch of condiments. You talked about 85 products total. Can you talk a little bit about that journey from the first product? to kind of building that out at a little bit higher scale? By the end of the year, we launched a second flavor of mayonnaise. We launched, kind of coincidentally, two collagen bars, snack bars, because we'd been working on those for two years and we just sort of branded them with the same brand, and two salad dressings. So here we are, a brand new company, and we're already in three aisles of the store, which was, again, totally contrary to every piece of advice we got from anybody who'd been in the business. 
Stick with what you know best. Don't start going into other aisles yet. And I guess it was my ignorance and hubris that just said, I'm going to do it differently. I'm just going to try and do it differently. When I had my co-founder at the time, Morgan Bueller, who is now the president of the company, now the Kraft owns it, she was instrumental in, and she agreed 100%, like, let's just do this. Let's just roll these things out. We're onto something here. The more products that we can identify that are ripe for disruption, we should be the first in line to do those. And we shouldn't have to wait until we filled out all of the dressings to start going into pasta sauces. So quite early on, we got into barbecue sauces and pasta sauces. And again, we were into protein bars in addition to collagen bars. So by the end of like year one, we thought we would do 300,000, but we did a million seven. Year two, we're like, oh, wow, that was such a big, great year. What do you think we can do year two? You think we like, should we ask the gods for six million? Is that possible? Or maybe even, who knows, maybe even eight. Well, by June, we'd done six million that year. So it really did take off. And then we started getting into some of the more conventional channels. So we'd really, we'd become very early on, we were the number one condiment in the natural channel with the mayonnaise. We had the top selling dressings by dollar volume in, we had six of the top eight best selling dressings in all of the Whole Foods. By then we got into all the Whole Foods in the country. And early on, some of the conventional groceries like Publix said, we like what you're doing. We think we'd like to take a shot. And so we got into Publix early on. And then our experience there with food, once you get into one or two large operations, now their competitors don't want to be caught short not having you on the shelves. And so it really opened up doors for us very quickly. So I'd like to say it was easy. It wasn't easy. It was really hard. And we had a great team of salespeople who were really kind of grinding it out. But we established a pretty strong foothold as early as possible. I'm curious with that sort of traction, like clearly when you talk about those numbers, predicting 300,000, selling 1.7, then doing six by the following June, those are staggering numbers. And I would guess at some point that competition or other players started to kind of notice what was going on. Did you see people suddenly start to pivot and move to try to copy or emulate what you were doing? Oh, absolutely. It's really frustrating. And on the one hand, on the other hand, I always have to go back and look at my original goal, which was to affect the lives of 10 million people by having them learn how their bodies work and to be able to take control of their health through their behavior. That 10 million became 100 million a few years ago. I added a zero to it around 2013 or something like that. So when I say I would like to affect the lives of 100 million people, at some point I'm leveraging even my competitors. Like if my competitors are selling great product or even good product or better product, better for you product, and it's affecting people's lives positively, and they say a rising tide lifts all boats, then how can I complain about that? But it was annoying at first because people were trying to copy our mayonnaise recipe and our jar and our color and our lid. A lot of companies kind of emulated our labeling, which we are, I think to this day, one of the things I'm most proud of is our labeling. It's really attractive. It's consistent across every line of product that we have. I'm very proud of that. I get a little annoyed when people try to copy, copy us in any way, shape or form in that regard. So yeah, there were a lot of competitors. And did you see people that were, I don't know, trying to portray that they were selling a similar product, but then you'd go and look at the ingredients and see that they were actually using all the <laughs> all the bad oils? Were people trying to, I guess, sell something that looked similar, but was in fact the same thing? <laughs> I think most of the people that copied us copied us because they saw we were onto something and they weren't about to do a less impressive version of what we were doing. They were trying really hard to do what we were doing just with a different branding. The condiment space, for example, has a number of players that are sort of in between. I would say that at the low end, you've got really kind of crappy oils and the kind of product that people who don't have a lot of disposable income are drawn to because it's such a great value for the money. And the taste, again, the crunchy, salty, fatty, sweet, the taste is awesome. At our end of the spectrum, we always wanted to be demonstrably the best. So whenever you pick up a ketchup or a mayonnaise and you look at all of the different boxes, does it have 
any offensive ingredients? Well, ours doesn't have any. Does it have functional ingredients? Yes. Is it organic? Yes. Is it unsweetened? Yes. And most importantly, does it taste great? Because it has to taste great. So getting all of those boxes checked off is a very difficult challenge, especially for companies that have been making low-end products for a long time. So a lot of them don't even try to compete. But those who try to compete as new entries, sometimes they try to play in the middle. They try to be almost as good, but demonstrably better than the bad stuff, but almost as or They make compromises. And so they can compete with us on price, for example. But we kind of know the buyer now of our product, and it's a very discerning buyer. So if there's any ingredient in there that's going to cause an eyebrow to raise, soybean oil or corn oil or some artificial ingredient or some form of sugar that gets, it's a fancy name, so you don't really know that it's sugar unless you know the name. A lot of our consumers know this now, and they will just not pick off the competitor's product and stick with ours. So to fast forward a little bit, so we've talked about kind of the beginning and maybe a little bit of the middle of the story of Primal Kitchen. But one thing that I learned doing research for this interview and the show is that it was actually sold to Heinz in 2018. And I think now they've finally taken that over. Talk a little bit about, I guess, that decision, how that process went, because I imagine that was both really rewarding, really exciting to finally get that recognition and have a major player and potentially also a way to take that mission and do it at a higher level. All of that. Yeah. So the goal had always been, once they started Primal Kitchen, for it to be the preeminent provider of sauces, dressings, and toppings in the world. And as with most companies, you start out and it's great. You throw an apron on, you go in the kitchen, you have some fun in making stuff up, R&D, then you see if you can scale it. Then you throw on another apron and set up a table outside of a health food store and you give away free samples. And it's, it's all great. It's all fun and games. Then you have to figure out, well, how are we going to make our payroll and how are we going to get through next year? And so you have to start thinking in terms of long strategic moves. And with my company, I quickly became one of the biggest buyers of avocado oil in the world. And avocado oil is a precious commodity and it takes a long time to get it. Sometimes the harvest of the season isn't as robust as it might be. And so we had to start investing in avocado oil a year in advance. And that was a cash demand that we didn't never really planned on, but certainly materialized very quickly. So you get to a point where most businesses can get to 10 million in sales pretty easily with their mom and pop founders and whatever. And then and then maybe to get to 50 million in sales, you got to shift everything around and you got to kind of go back and reconfigure your executives, your sales team and what you're doing and rethink your margins. And then to get from 50 to 100, once again. So there's a point at which I just didn't have the energy or at that point, the expertise to scale this to where I wanted to get to where we're a billion in sales. My goal while I'm still involved the company is for us to see a billion in sales at Primal Kitchen because it is recognized across the board as the best, the preeminent company making sauces, dressings, toppings, food enhancers, if you will, in the world. And I started to recognize that as we we're closing in on, say, 50 million in sales annually. And I thought, not that I fire anybody, but I can't keep hiring new industry executives to ramp up for the next level of expansion, which also involves warehouses and SAP and all sorts of processing software and things that are massive investments and take a lot of resources and a lot of time. And to be quite honest, don't interest me that much. So I said, well, let's find a company that will love and cherish us and allow us to keep doing what we're doing, but we'll have resources, we'll open doors. So financial resources as well as advisory resources. And that was Kraft Heinz. And it's almost two years now, and it's been an amazing alliance. They have been spectacular. People were afraid, oh my God, when they buy you, they're going to change all the ingredients and they're going to ruin your brand. And I'm like, nothing could be further from the truth. The first thing they did was they said, hey, Mark, we love what you're doing. We want to learn from you. We want to keep your team. We want you to keep doing what you're doing because we know you're doing it the right way. And so we're not going to touch you at all. We're just going to let you flourish and keep growing. And it's been phenomenal. So it's far exceeded any expectation I had. And I'm still the face of the brand. It's still my baby. I don't own it, but it's still my baby. And I'm intimately involved in R&D and in a lot of sales meetings and 
processes going on like that. So it's been a very gratifying experience. So just one more question, and then I want to transition and talk about, kind of bounce across a bunch of what you cover in your blog, Mark's Daily Apple. But one thing I'm curious if you can answer is either products from Primal Kitchen that you love, and if you can share anything that you're working on or thinking about that people can look forward to. I eat a lot of meat. I'm a carnivore, like in a big way. But I like steak sauce, and some of the steak sauces that were available maybe had too much sugar. Some had gluten in them. So we wanted to come up with a steak sauce that emulated, I won't name names, but it's the number one sought after steak sauce in in the country. And we came up with something that is unbelievable. It's just so perfectly spot on and checks off all the boxes about the ingredients. So I'm very happy and proud of that. Perhaps I'm most proud of the ketchup. We were already two and a half years into this mission. We sort of avoided ketchup thinking somebody was already maybe working on something or doing something that was going to be what we felt ketchup should be. And there were a couple of players in the natural channel that were organic and unsweetened, but honestly tasted horrible. And then there were a couple that tasted great and were organic, but had a lot of sugar in them, but nobody could kind of check off all three boxes. And so we really made a concerted effort to solve that problem. And we did so partly because Whole Foods had come to us and said, you're doing so well with all these other condiments. Why don't we have a ketchup? So they really placed a massive order for ketchup that got us, that prompted us to solve that equation. And we did. And we launched it in middle of 2018, toward the end of 2018. And at the Natural Products East food show out of, I don't know, 8,000 exhibitors and quarter million different products being exhibited, we won the Consumer Choice Award in that show. And that was the consumer saying, wow, somebody finally did it. They made a great tasting, organic, unsweetened ketchup that I'm going to feel really good about giving to my kids and about letting my kids not just douse on everything, but helping introduce new foods to my kids using this ketchup. So that's one that I'm very proud of. And now we have a line of frozen meals, of steak fajita that I really, I'm really digging. And because I'm a big fan of Thai food, we have a Thai chicken meal, a curry chicken meal. It's tough to name my favorite because there's so many that are my favorites. In the beginning, like the first two years, everything we did was to satisfy my palate. So it was like, this is what I want because it doesn't exist. About two years in, we started analyzing the data and going, oh, all right, what is it that other people want besides you, Mark? <laughs> What is it that the world wants or the Whole, food, <laughs> the whole Foods buyers wants? So I want to now transition a little bit and basically start to explore kind of all the branches of your, the way that you think about health and fitness and nutrition and exercise and sunlight and all of that. But where I wanted to start is just maybe having you give a little bit of background on the word primal, because I know that that's kind of building off of paleo. I know that some of it is also a little bit of kind of ancestral wisdom. Can you talk about what primal is and how that's different than maybe paleo or ancestral? Or, Well, I've used the term primal for 30 plus years, 40 years actually, since probably 1980. My first, I was a personal trainer back when it was, I was one of the few in Los Angeles. when It was, uh, you just were basically a personal trainer to the stars. And my company was called Primal Fitness. And then I published a book in the mid-80s under the name of Primal Urge Press. And then when I was coming up with a name for my supplement company, which was 1995 that I started this, I wanted something, again, that evoked sort of this primal urge, primal scream, primalness first in importance. And that became Primal Nutrition, which was the name of my supplement company. So by the time the Primal Blueprint, the book came around and my seminal work in organizing the 10 Primal Blueprint laws, I wanted a brand that meshed with paleo, that took advantage of the interest in paleo. But I felt paleo was just a little too, it sounded a little too Fred Flintstone for me and a little too kind of, I don't know, possible that it was going to go out of style or out of fashion. So Primal, once again, reared its beautiful head and said, and then the blueprint part came in because I was really kind of looking at 
the human genome in general and how we're all basically so much the same. We build protein the same way. We build muscle the same way. We burn fat the same way. Our immune systems work the same way. It's just the degree to which these things operate that differs among individuals. But the basic premise, the blueprint is pretty much the same. And the rest is kind of up to you. And the notion of the blueprint took on a meaning of the primal blueprint was sort of the basic structural thing. And if you want to make a few enhancements and change the color of the tile over here and, and change the lighting in that part of your body to use a construction analogy, that it was fine. You could just stick to the main template, but you could adjust and adapt according to your own experiment of one. The N equals one became a big part of this. So you have a template overriding this where I'll tell people, get rid of grains, get rid of legumes to start with, get rid of sugars. But then after you've cleaned your act up, after you've achieved some measure of metabolic flexibility, after you've trended or arrived at your ideal body composition, you can play around with it. Now, you might want to add back a couple of grains if they are that important to your palate and would enhance your life that much. Or if you want to drink wine once in a while, there's certain types of wines that you could have. Or if you want to add back in some chocolate, even though it's probably contraindicated for some people. So the template became the primal blueprint. So that was the books and everything I did, all of the seminars I did from 2006 until 2014. Then when I started the idea of the food company, like what am I going to call it? Paleo Kitchen? It was Primal Kitchen, clearly and obviously. So I've really stuck to the term primal for the last 40 years because I like the term. And as I say, it has so many different levels of significance. Yes, it's ancestral, but it's also primary in nature. It's the essence of anything that you're, it's the baseline of what you're starting from. It's the pureness of what it is. And that's why I've always loved the term primal. So I want to go from there and I guess jump into and explore a little bit of I guess just the idea of being a carnivore. So I know a big part of the diet, a big part of what you advocate is eating meat, which has gotten controversial on both sides. And now we have people that have a carnivore only diet, which can certainly help people. I know that have like autoimmune issues or my brother actually tried it and had a lot of success with it for a while. There's people on that side of the fence. There's also continues to be a surge of people that want to try to go plant only or plant with a little bit of fish. So I'm curious just to, I don't know, try to, if you could help flesh out some of your thinking, uh, your research around out. why it's so important <laughs> to have a carnivore diet and maybe what you would say to people that think that meat is negative or destructive or counter to being healthy. Now we get into the same sort of discussion you might have in arguing whose religion is better. So when you start talking with people about their way of eating, I'm never going to convince a vegan to eat meat, and I never want to. That's a choice that people make, and I'm fine with that. What I do know is that humans have always eaten meat. It's one of the things that defines our direction in evolution and was largely responsible for this brain that we have that has become our main survival tool. So yeah, we don't have claws, we don't have razor-sharp teeth, but we have a brain that allows us to make tools to hunt animals and to carve up the carcass. We're able to build fire to prepare the food. And this has been going on for the fire parts has been going on for anywhere from 400 to 700,000 a year. So we grew up eating meat, all of us, and we evolved eating meat. If it wasn't large beasts like mastodons or aurochs, which would be the older equivalent of a cow, it was lizards and snails and bird's eggs. And It was clams and mussels by the sea, and it was eels. There was always some form of animal flesh that was sustaining us and contributing to the building of a better brain through a combination of quality protein, through DHA and EPA, which are essential fatty acids, EPA, which you can only find in fish. Otherwise, the body has to convert plant food into these essential fatty acids. So... We're no different. I mean, we still have the genetic composition of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. When I say I'm a carnivore, I eat meat, and I pretty much eat meat every day, sometimes twice a day. I eat plants, too. I had a big thing of steamed broccoli with garlic last night and a glass of wine, a big steak, and I was the happiest camper you could imagine. I don't just eat meat. There are people who just eat meat, and like you say, if your brother tried it and has had great success, it's a pretty impressive experiment. 
to do that for 30 days or 60 days, or as some people have done years, and find out that all of their blood work improves. It doesn't get better. All of their inflammation goes away. Their gut issues go away. People think, well, you have to have plant food in order to feed the gut bacteria and to push all of the stuff through your gut so you have robust fecal matter. I'm like, no, you don't. It's just, for lack of a better term, a poop or turd is just basically dead bacteria from your gut. Just your gut just expelling it. You don't need to push it through with a broom is the visual that some people get. So this notion that we have to have lots of fiber for healthy intestines is just wrong. In fact, some people are ill-served by upping their fiber intake if they do have digestive problems. So if somebody's interested in trying an all-meat diet, it's very safe. It's extremely safe. And nothing bad's going to happen. And maybe something good will happen. And if it doesn't, if you don't get the results that you're seeking, bail. I mean, it's pretty easy. But you're not going to throw your cholesterol out of whack and have a heart attack or any of these things that people are starting to cite as issues. If you do have heart problems, share your decision with a medical person. But all of the indications currently are that meat is not just okay to eat. It's good for you. It's beneficial. It's the best quality form of protein there is. And now, as the discussion starts to center on climate change, man-made global warming, yada, 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 which I'm not a big fan of, but, and they talk about how beef is raised in this country. Look, I agree that that concentrated animal feedlot operations are horrible. They're bad for the environment. They're bad for the cows. They don't produce the best meat. That if you can get a hold of grass-fed beef, these are cows and beeves that have been fed the diet that they evolved to consume and that they evolved to thrive on just by grazing on grass all the time. If you can find a cut of meat like that, that might be one of the healthiest things you can eat. And now there's a movie out called Sacred Cow, which looks at possibly raising beef this way and growing grass. They call it regenerative agriculture, using otherwise unused grasslands, of which there are hundreds of millions of acres across the U.S., to graze beef on grass and let them reclaim the land by pooping on the ground and then driving that into the ground and fertilizing the soil and improving the quality of the soil. It may be that that's the way we feed the world, literally with having people eat more beef and lamb and pork and chicken, whatever. So it's a very heady topic of discussion and not one that you want to have at an all vegan dinner. Yeah, it's polarizing for sure, but I knew you would have some good takes on it. Do you have any rule of thumbs that you follow then? Obviously, you enjoy steak. Do you have any rules of thumb that you follow in terms of how often to eat what? Or is it just really kind of listening to your body, listening to what you crave? Or Yeah, it's listening to what I crave and it's listening to what is going to make my face happy at that time. So like I want to have steak three nights in a row, even though I like steak because I like, okay, I got to have something different tonight. Maybe I'll have some salmon tonight or maybe I'll have some shrimp. And I do get a sense of what I'm hungry for. I have the luxury of living in an area where there's some great restaurants that are within dope walking distance. So I can get virtually any kind of food I want at any time. And I can have them prepare it the way I want them to prepare it because I know the chefs. So that's one of the luxuries of being retired and having sold my company. And then having said that, I do access, like I get steaks delivered every month from ButcherBox. And I'm a mean steak cooker. I can prepare a steak in record time and have it taste fabulous and not have a lot of fuss and muss and clean up. So I don't mind cooking a steak myself. And I do that quite often. And then I'll just have maybe a vegetable or a salad with it. So like I say, every bite of food I put in my mouth, I want to taste great. I don't want to choke down something that's supposed to be good for me, but doesn't taste great. So I just make sure that the two meals I eat every day are delicious. So I'm looking at my list of questions here and there's so much that obviously I feel like I could ask you questions for another hour or two, but I'm going to try to distill it down a little bit. So I had a whole bunch of questions. We're just jumping off points around things like your thoughts on kind of sunlight, your thoughts on natural movement and doing a little bit of light movement earlier in the day, your thoughts about mobility and pliability or kind of like sleep and vitamin D. There's a whole bunch of topics there, but maybe just to use that as a jumping off point, if someone listening 
loves your ideas about how we should be changing how we think about fitness, how we should change how we think about what we eat. Do you have other kind of like tips or rules of thumb? Or can you even share maybe what you do in a day just to make sure? So let's talk about the list that you just gave. So first of all, sunlight, absolutely essential. And it's criminal that most dermatologists would say, stay out of the sun. I think everybody needs 10 to 20 minutes of unprotected sun on as much of their body as they can get every day. And that doesn't mean burn. It just means get sun and don't get into a burn situation, but get actual sunlight without sunscreen, without a cover-up on. And then if you're just going to stay out of the sun, then cover up or put on sunscreen. But that's how we make vitamin D. Vitamin D is critical to our health. So vitamin D for sure. Sleep. Look, people don't get enough sleep. I make no apologies for the fact that I try to get nine hours of sleep a night. I typically wind up with eight and a half, but if I can get nine, I will. If I go 1030 to 730, I will do that. And sleep is when the body restores and regenerates itself. And you shouldn't think in terms of, well, I'm missing out on something. I'm missing out on this party or I'm missing out on this TV show that I could stay up and watch for another two hours, but I'm a big fan of getting sleep. Moving around a lot. I have a stand-up desk. I have a squatting desk. I'm walking around all the time throughout the day. I'm not jogging. I'm not running. I'm not riding a bike. I do all those, but I'm typically just moving. Just the movement alone. Forget the calories. Just the movement alone. Putting your body through different ranges and planes of motion will increase your mobility. Twice a week, I go to the gym. I did today, and I do about 45 minutes of heavy lifting. For me, it's all upper body because one day every 10 days, I could do nothing but legs in the gym. And then I just have fun. I ride a fat bike up and down the beach for pleasure. It's great. It's a great workout. I do stand-up paddling. In front of my house, I have a great ocean that I can just, when the weather's good, I can just go out. I have a regular standing game of ultimate frisbee. I love playing ultimate. It's sprinting like crazy for two hours with changing direction and trying to catch a frisbee in the air and trying to intercept it when it's thrown to somebody else. Look, I try to have as much fun as I can with my activities, with my motion, with my movement. And I encourage everyone to do that, to move around as much as you can and to make it as fun as you can, as often as you can. That's all great advice. So I want to just move and ask a couple of closing questions. So one is you have, I don't even know the number, I guess maybe can you give people a sense for how many books you've published at this point? I've written about 15. I think I've I published other authors too. So I've published another... 30 books by other authors, but I've written 15 myself. And some of those are cookbooks. I mean, some of them are kind of more philosophical books like the Primal Blueprint. Your latest book, I believe, is Keto for Life. If someone listening really wants to jump in, is there one book you recommend that they start with? Primal Blueprint. That'll give you the science, the background, the frame of reference, so that every other book you read of mine after that, you go, oh, yeah, 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 I get that. I could do that. So the Primal Blueprint is my magnum opus. So one thing we ask every guest, and you just went through a bunch of them, but is there one thing that you try to do every single day? It could be a practice, could be a routine, could be a tool that you use that you rely on and that you feel like helps you show up as your best self each day. So I have a practice that I do every day. I choose. Every day I choose to keep doing what I'm doing. Every day I get up and basically the first couple of thoughts are, I've had a good life. I've done a lot of cool stuff. I'm pretty comfortable. If I stop right now, Everything would be fine not to get modeling. But if I died today, I'd be happy with what I've done and what I've had. But I could go on. I could keep doing some new cool stuff. So today I'm going to choose to keep going on. And I just allow myself the right to not do so, but it hasn't happened yet. So (laughs) I'm just choosing into a new day. Yeah, it would be concerning the day you choose. (laughs) You decide not to continue. Yeah, yeah. And then one other question we ask every guest is for a person or experience that you're eternally grateful for that had a huge impact in your life, somebody that showed up, and if you could share that story with us. Well, an experience, I did Outward Bound when I was 17, and that transformed my life. So are you familiar with Outward Bound? I know the name. I don't know them with much familiarity. It was known in the day as a survival camp. It was a 28-day survival course, and it changed my life. I went from the small, scrawny, runner, wimpy kid, nerd, to a confident, strong, athletic guy at the end of that who emerged as a leader who came out with a renewed sense of what I would be able to accomplish if I put myself to it. That's how I became captain of the cross-country team and the track team and so on. So Outward Bound was a massively 
life-changing experience. And I would encourage anyone who has teenage kids to look into doing that. And then I'd say, like my dad, who was just a Renaissance man. He played piano. He was a painter. He made a living doing it. He made jewelry. When the paintings weren't selling, he just had to have something that he could sell. He was a hustler in terms of if it wasn't the season, he worked in a shipyard just doing odds and ends. I mean, he was a true Renaissance man. He could do a lot of cool stuff. I really got endowed with a sense of what's possible from him. And that clearly shows up. I mean, you have a very clear sense of kind of where you want to head in life and a very clear sense of the impact you want to make. And I imagine some of that likely came from your dad. So for anyone listening that wants to follow you, where can they find you online? Where can they learn more about you? Well, MarkSpaleyApple.com is my blog, and that's the best place to start. Primalkitchen.com, or you just Google Primal Kitchen, and you'll come up with all of our wonderful products, either at our own site or on Amazon or at a store near you. And then Keto for Life is my latest book, Keto for Life. And then again, if you want to start with the beginning, it's the Primal Blueprint. And that's pretty much it. Well, thank you so much. We've covered a ton of stuff today. I would highly encourage anyone listening to go to Mark's Daily Apple and follow Mark on Twitter because he's just constantly covering and bringing up really interesting ideas. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. Thanks for being on Outliers. Thanks for having me. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to everything mentioned in this episode, visit danielscrivener.com. There you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter, where each week I send out a single email with all of the best quotes, themes, and ideas from the latest episode. To sign up for that, visit danielscrivener.com slash email. Just one more thing before you take off. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Great reviews help us land great guests. So if you've enjoyed this episode, take 30 seconds to leave a short review. We would so appreciate it. Thank you so much.